Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the kind introduction. And also for the one by Hitoshi Yamamoto uh, about an hour ago. Uh, I'm very happy to, to uh, participate in the Tohoku Forum for Creativity. Interestingly, creativity is a, an under, underused word in uh, uh, sciences. We talk about creative, creativity a lot in the arts. Uh, but it, as you could see from the last talk, it's also very deeply embedded in what we do in forefront, uh, forefront science. I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, well, really about gravitational waves, but with the underlying theme of how with a new kind of probe, uh, we, we are studying and will be able to study the universe in a in a new and very exciting uh, way. I'm gonna start by talking about a little bit of history so we can see kind of where we are in, in perspective as we proceed forward. So first, the modern era of science or astronomy really started in 1610. In 1610, Galileo for the first time took a telescope. He did not, he did not invent the telescope but he used lenses that were really made for eyeglasses at that time. They were able to make high quality ones. And for the first time without just the naked eye, he looked at the planet Jupiter. And what he saw was what he called at the beginning stars, moving in the opposite direction to the uh, orbit of, of uh, Jupiter itself. He watched for several nights and he saw four of these. And eventually he realized that these were not stars that were just in the field of view, but rather moons for Jupiter itself. And he interpreted all that within a few days, looking through an instrument instead of the uh, human eye, just the human eye. And that was the beginning of modern astronomy. It's progressed over 400 years. In an incredible way, what we know about the universe and what we've discovered about the universe is pretty phenomenal. Uh, the biggest, probably, advancement in our ability to look at the universe comes about, came about during the 20th century when we started looking at objects, like I show here, the Crab Nebula, in, with different instruments that look at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, when you were Galileo or anyone after that, you only look at a very tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Since that time, we now can look with instruments and of better and better resolution in the radio, the microwave, the uh, infrared, the ultraviolet, the x-ray, and even high energy gamma rays. And looking at the same object, kind of like I show on the right for the Crab Nebula, gives you different pieces of the science that creates the different parts. And this has really enabled us to understand really a lot about the dynamics of our universe. As we move into the 21st century, we saw at least one example of uh, maybe another advancement, and this was combining instruments instead of looking at wavelengths. And that was done uh, by looking at, if you look at the picture on the left, at uh, radio telescopes that existed in the world of uh, different ones, the biggest being ALMA in South America, one at the South Pole, some in Europe, some in the US, some in Asia pulling together all these instruments uh, together, which they were never made, been built uh, to be used together, but the clever experimentalists managed to take the data and make it look like one giant radio telescope the size of the earth. And doing that, we all were treated uh, in 2017 to this beautiful image, which I show on the right, of M87 uh, black hole uh, where the surface and the changes in the surface were observed uh, over several days. Technically that required taking uh, the data from all these different instruments as shown in the picture on the left 
uh, bringing them together somehow around the world, uh, putting them in a, a format where they could be used together, uh, putting them in a way that made them work as one instrument, and then drawing an image like we see here. And that was the beginning in the 21st century of not only looking at different, being able to look at different wavelengths, but actually being able to combine and make a, an instrument the size of the Earth. That theme will come back as I talk about gravitational waves. So the next frontier that most of us believe has begun uh, is to look at astronomical phenomena or dynamics in a way that uses not just electromagnetic radiation in different wavelengths, but uses other messengers that carry the signal. So we've just talked about the electromagnetic ones where we have a lot now of, of uh, sophisticated instruments on the earth and in, the, in space. Um, and we're beginning now to be able to do using, uh, as I'll show, the same uh, astronomical event and measure the gravitational waves that come from it. And also we're just at the birth of being able to do that with neutrinos. The uh, object shown in the middle is the LIGO detectors uh, that detect gravitational waves. And on the right is the uh, under ice detector at the South Pole that called ice cube that measures high energy neutrinos. So that's all back. I'm going to concentrate on gravitational waves and work my way toward where gravitational waves are a full partner in doing this, and when, when it'll happen and how it's happening. But let's go back first and try to understand a little bit about gravitational waves. And I'll start with, with gravity itself. So we all learned gravity in, when we were young from Newton. In fact, Newton's theory of gravity written in the Principia in 1687 is arguably the most uh, successful theory of physics ever. Uh, it's simple in the sense that he uh, wrote down one main formula shown here that the force between two massive objects, the force of attraction between those two objects is equal to some constant that's the strength of the gravitational field uh, times the product of the two masses that are attracting each other and divided by the square of how far apart they are. The constant that goes in front that gives the strength, he didn't know how strong that was. And it took another hundred years before that was determined. But that was what Einstein did. He called it universal gravity. And in fact, for more than 200 years, it uh, essentially explained anything that had to do with gravity, whether you're talking about the apple falling out of the tree, or you're talking about uh, or worrying about the moon going around the sun, the moon going around the earth, or the earth around the sun, or the waves in the ocean, all things that are caused by gravity. And basically with one small exception, which I'll show you, that was still the valid way to look at everything to do with gravity when, the top, when Einstein came along. But in 1915, 230 years after um, Newton, Einstein developed a new theory of gravity based on what's called general relativity. I use a formula here on the right, I'm not gonna explain it in the same way, which is more or less the equivalent formula in general relativity to Einstein's theory. The main thing conceptually is that Einstein's theory of gravity is based on unifying space and time into one four dimensional space time. That means we always know there's space and there's time, but rather than being independent, they're all together in explaining our gravity. And uh, that's Einstein's theory of gravity. Why he would come up with a new theory of gravity in 1915 when Newton's was so successful is 
is really because of the underlying uh, physics that's not described in Newton's theory and the fact that Einstein developed in 1905 the theory of special relativity, uh, relativity when something goes very fast, but that's for high velocity, high velocities, and he wanted to add accelerations to the problem. Accelerations represent gravity. So that's what Einstein did. There was one and only one observation that uh, disagreed a little bit with Newton's theory of gravity. And that was the orbit of Mercury around the sun. I show it here on the left. It's kind of a, a very elliptical, long, long orbit. Uh, and uh, on the right, as it goes around each time, it's pulled by the gravity of all the uh, planets, moons, and so forth. And it comes back at a somewhat different spot. And the whole picture looks a, a, a little bit like uh, a flower or something. You can calculate from the knowledge of all the planets and moons and so forth, how far it should move. And Newton's theory almost gets the right answer, but it doesn't. And this is the only puzzle. Newton gets 532 arc seconds per century. Well, what's observed is uh, 575 arc seconds uh, per century. So in a sense, uh, there was one observation with about a 10% disagreement with Newton's theory at the time Einstein came along. So why do we need a new theory of gravity? Well, actually for quite a few reasons, which I'll try to show you. First, it's a little bit embarrassing, but when we all talk about Newton's theory of gravity, we talk about the apple falling out of the tree, for example. Or when you went to school, you, your teacher said, when you jumped up, the earth pulled you down. Or when the apple uh, falls, the earth pulls it down to the, the, the earth. It's interesting that Newton only took that as a fact and never explain why these masses attract each other. Why does the apple fall to the earth at all? Why uh, do, does the moon attract it and go around the earth and it's pulled to the earth? What is the gravitational pull that's so strong? This wasn't really understood. People tried to explain it in the after Newton in the 18, 1900s, usually with some sort of explanation that had to do with electricity and magnetism, which were wrong. Uh, Einstein, in his new theory, explains why the apple falls. I won't go through that in any detail, but conceptually, you can see it in the picture here. The picture shows a grid, uh, like a trampoline that you might jump on. And if you put the mass on it, it distorts the trampoline uh, locally. And so all every point that is moved from just the flat surface that existed before the moon was put on, before the earth was put onto the surface. And uh, when the earth gets there, it's distorting the space around it. And that causes basically a well and the objects near it are attracted to it. So, so the distortion of space time, these words, that are often used to describe Einstein's theory are actually incredibly important and are the reason why the objects, objects actually attract each other in gravity. A second problem that existed in Newton's theory of gravity was the conceptual one. And this is one that Newton actually recognized. If you read the Principia in 1687, where he wrote down his theory of gravity, he referred to the fact that it has what he, what he called and what we might call instantaneous action at a distance. That means that when the apple falls, you detect it falling immediately, even though you're not, there's some distance between you and the apple. It doesn't matter very much, certainly between you and the apple, but if we talk about objects that are further apart astronomically, 
astronomical objects, which was really the motivation in Einstein's case, then we should realize that, for example, in the picture that I have below, it's a picture of the sun and the earth. And if the sun were to somehow disappear right now, uh, in Newton's theory, we would know it immediately. Of course, there's no time involved, but we know that it takes eight minutes for light to come from the sun to the earth. In Einstein's theory of gravity, that's also the speed of gravity or and of gravitational waves when I get to it. And that takes eight minutes. So basically we don't know for eight minutes that the sun has dissolved or disappeared. And conceptually, this fact that instantaneous action at a distance actually takes some time is really important astronomically. And so Einstein's theory of gravity is crucial for relativistic astrophysics, a whole subject uh, that we use today. Einstein's theory made a new prediction. So it solved the conceptual, two conceptual problems. It uh, described with the right answer, Mercury going around the sun. And lastly, Einstein realized, if you think of the picture of the massive object on the grid, that an object, um, that it doesn't really matter whether the object that's near there has mass or zero mass. It's going to be affected by, its, by the, the distortion of space and time near a massive object. So he predicted that if we have a beam of light, not a beam of particles, but a beam of light that grazes near the sun, it's gonna curve. He carried that a step further and predicted that if you had a full eclipse of the sun and some stars go behind it, behind the sun, that the bending, the, those, the light from those objects would bend as it went around the sun. You could detect it because the sun is dark and he predicted that an experiment should be done and how much the bending would be. That experiment was done successfully by Sir Arthur Eddington in 1919. And that, that uh, proof that the bending of light around the sun occurred was the dramatic, let's say, proof that Einstein's theory was right, gravity was right. And, uh, it uh, also is what made Einstein a household name. Einstein then uh, basically went uh, a step further and uh, I'll talk about that next, but let me just say one other comment first. In modern astronomy, this idea that light bends as it goes around a massive object has become a tool uh, basic, basically called gravitational lensing, which is used commonly in astronomy as a tool to understand an object by watching the starlight from behind it uh, go past it. And this is a rule in physics that happens often. You, you basically make a discovery, and then that discovery often becomes a new tool for further discoveries. These pictures on the right that I show here are just examples of this bending of light around some object. The one on the, the top is just what happens if you go around a dark object and you see the bending. And the one on the bottom is the most common one that can be seen almost with the naked eye, usually in the Southern hemisphere called the Einstein cross. It's an illustration of the bending of light or gravitational lensing. One more thing before I come to, to gravitational waves. Uh, General relativity for most people is very abstract. It's mathematically very difficult. It's difficult to calculate things in these four dimensions, as I mentioned earlier, but it actually is important to all of us in our everyday life. And it's an illustration that advances in physics as abstract as they might seem uh, can be very, very important to all of us. In this case, we all use a system, the GPS system, to locate where we are, whether we're driving our car or hiking around a mountain or, where, or, or just determining where something is. Uh, and that system uses, the original system, used 28 satellites. Those satellites are going at about 
14,000 kilometers per hour. And you know, for those that uh, have studied relativity, you know that when something goes fast, that's relativistic, that a moving clock ticks more slowly. And if you do the calculation going 14,000 kilometers an hour, the correction per day of the clock going more slowly in the satellite is about seven microseconds a day. So there's a correction that has to be made in the satellites of seven microseconds per day from the fact that the objects, are, the satellites are going very rapidly and that's a correction of special relativity. But in addition, there's a correction for general relativity. That correction is due to the fact that at high altitude where the satellites are, there's only about a quarter as much gravitational field as on the Earth's surface. And so a correction has to be made for the general relativistic effects. It has the opposite sign of the one for special relativity and is actually quite a bit larger. It's 45 microseconds per day. So the total correction, GPS correction is 38 microseconds a day. And if that correction were not made, uh, we wouldn't have all this great accuracy that we do in tracking where we're going as humans or more, even more accurately for things that somebody wants to measure with these uh, satellites. By the way, 38 microseconds per day, if we didn't do it, uh, would uh, corresponds to the following. If you need something like 10 meter resolution, okay, the, size of a pretty big highway. Uh, the accuracy needed to do that is 30 nanoseconds. If I have a, a uh, correction of 38 microseconds to make per day, then the 30 nanoseconds corresponds to only a couple minutes. So within only a couple minutes, if this correction for general relativity weren't made, you would go off the road with your car. So general relativity is important in everyday life. Okay, now on to gravitational waves. Gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein the year after he came out with the theory of general relativity. This is the original paper or the head of the original paper. It was published in 1916, one year after uh, general relativity. And in that paper, he predicted that there were gravitational waves. He did that not by deriving it from the formulas of general relativity. He didn't know how to do that. But rather, because if he formulated the formulas in a certain way, they looked familiar, different symbols, but familiar to, and I'll show you that, in, in, to the formulas in electricity and magnetism. And we know that uh, electricity and magnetism has, wave, has waves, radio waves, microwaves, all kinds of waves. And so he predicted there must also be uh, waves in general relativity or waves in gravity. And that's gravitational waves. The original paper conjectures that it, he has a couple of mistakes in it. He fixes those mistakes in 1918. And adds the fact that in order to make gravitational waves in, in contrast to electricity and magnetism, where you do it with an oscillating dipole, you do it with a quadrupole formula. So he gave us the information that we use experimentally in finding a source that will give uh, gravitational waves. I show that here, uh, show what the fact is here in uh, an illustration, which is the ones that we use. Two objects going around each other, gravitationally attracted, will radiate by Einstein's theory, kind of like the picture on the right, as a natural consequence of uh, special relativity. Because as I said earlier, the speed of gravitation is the speed of light. They'll radiate outwards with the speed of light. They're different than electromagnetic radiation, because at least in Einstein's theory, which is a classical theory, there's no equivalent of the photon. So the gravitational waves just are, are distortions of space and time themselves. Mm -hmm.
one formula, that's all I'll show you. But if I formulate from general relativity, I did it in a particular way that I defined for the experts on the left. Uh, in a particular way, for anyone who has studied electricity and magnetism, the formula on the right looks familiar. It has a little funny thing, h mu nu. That's basically what we measure when we see how much space and time gets distorted. And it's the parameter that's measured in gravitational waves. But if we look at the formula, it's familiar. It looks like the wave equation for electricity and magnetism. And we know the wave equation uh, basically gives plane waves. The waves propagate for electromagnetism in two, with two polarizations uh, at 90 degrees to each other. In this case, as you'll see in the picture that I just drew, gravitational waves will also have two components and they propagate uh, but instead of 90 degrees to each other, they propagate at 45 degrees to each other. And that's a reflection of the fact that gravity is spin two and electricity and magnetism or the photon is spin one. So a quantum mechanical uh, difference. We haven't yet been able to separate these two components. We're sure that they exist, uh, but we need better data on three detectors. And so far, the third detector isn't quite strong enough to have for us to have data where we can do this yet, but we will. So one of the, net, one of the, one of the accomplishments that I think we'll do over the next few years, which I'm sure you'll read about, is that we'll prove that, that uh, gravitational waves have two components and that they're at 45 degrees to each other. General relativity was not immediately uh, accepted. It got accepted as a subject when the bending of light was seen. But during that whole period, all of you that, have, that know physics know that in the 1920s and 1930s uh, and beyond, the whole new field of quantum mechanics basically dominated uh, physics. But there were a small number of people, including Einstein, who worked on general relativity. Uh, Einstein worked on general relativity and tried to find unification of the forces, but he didn't return to the problem of uh, gravitational waves until the 1930s, in which case, at what time, which time he wasn't sure that they existed for a while because of the complication of doing the calculations. So the field was somewhat um, controversial until 1957. In 1957, there was a, a meeting in, in the US in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where there were about 40 of the world's leading general relativists who were taking part. And uh, at that meeting, the gravitational wave problem was basically solved or agreed to. There were two, there were more than two, but there were two key contributions. One by a general relativist named Pirani, who actually derived a uh, gravitational wave, something Einstein had tried to do but failed, uh, out of general relativity. And Dick Feynman, who basically said that if gravitational waves exist and they're, they're real, then they have to be able to do something. In particular, they should be able to transfer energy. So he developed the uh, uh, thought experiment or a Gedanken experiment, which is shown on the right. If I have a rod and a couple of rings on it and a gravitational wave goes through it, like shown on the bottom, the bar will expand at the frequency of the wave and move the objects out. Then when the wave goes through the other direction, it'll come in so the little beads will oscillate back and forth, but to move them required friction. Friction will gives heat when it moves something, and that's a transfer of energy. So basically this little argument shows that gravitational waves can transfer energy. Mathematically, they can be derived out of general relativity. So at this point, by about 1960, it was no longer just a theoretical problem but a problem of whether experimentalists could actually see or detect gravitational waves. 
Uh, I won't go through that history, but rather to show you what we have to do to, to detect gravitational waves. As I said earlier, it's a quadrupole moment that's responsible for gravitational waves. And what I show on the left is if I have two objects circulating around each other, they could be black holes, neutron stars, or barbells, but going around each other, they will radiate away gravitational radiation. Because of that, they'll slowly spiral in toward each other. They can be spinning as shown on the left picture. And as they finally come together, they'll merge. And then everything has to settle down into uh, presumably a neutron star or black hole or whatever the final state is. So the picture, as I show on the left, is kind of what we call a chirp signal or the rising uh, higher frequency and larger amplitude signal as the objects come together. The merger, which is a complicated piece of physics, which I just show as a bunch of wiggles here, and then a ring down that, again, you can calculate that has to do with the final state that was set up. And, and all those can then presumably be measured. There's quite a few examples that could come from neutron star, two neutron stars uh, merging together. Uh, there, it's easy to calculate the waveforms. They're well described. Uh, if we have two black holes instead, the, the gravitational fields are so strong, we need numerical relativity to, to calculate the waveforms. And they can be combinations, black holes and neutron stars, for example. So that's what we're looking for. And to do that, we basically then have to ask how you would see it in an instrument. There are rip, as I said, there are ripples in space-time itself. They stretch and they compress space-time. The amplitude for what we see, which is a pretty uh, spectacular event in space, is that little same little h I showed on the formula is a number that can be characterized as 10 to the minus 21. What that means in terms of an actual physical effect is if I have a ring of particles as shown here, just a ring of free, free masses, and we have a radius L, then the change of length L is proportional to this little h, 10 to the minus 21 times L. So what happens is, as the gravitational wave goes through, it distorts the circular free masses, makes them elliptical, where the amount of ellipticity delta L is 10 to the minus 21. If the circle were one meter in size, then we talk about a, a distortion in the one meter circle of 10 to, the mi 10 to the minus 21 meters. That's a pretty small number, obviously. And so the first thing to realize is then if you're an experimentalist and you want to measure this, you probably don't want to try to do it in one meter. Instead, we try to do it in as large an instrument as we can make. And that's uh, kilometers in scale instead of meters in scale, which at least makes the number 10 to the minus 21, a number that's more like 10 to the minus 18 meters that we have to be able to see. I'll remind you that 10 to the minus 18 meters is smaller than the size of a proton. So we have to see distortions of this circle in uh, basically that are the level of the size of a proton. We do that by using a very sophisticated uh, and enhanced Michelson interferometer. So to remind you what an interferometer is, I show you the picture in the upper right. If you take a laser beam and you bring it in and split the beam, that's what's done in this center, and send it down two arms, then if the two arms are equal in length, the beam will come back at the same time from the two arms. And uh, if the arms are the same length, you can invert one with respect to the other, and they'll just cancel. And my little detector, which is shown here where it says light detector, will see nothing. But if there's a distortion such that one arm gets longer than the other, then they come back at slightly different times or out of phase, and then we see an effect. That's, so what happens in an exaggerated way as you go through one cycle 
is shown in the very bottom, where the scale is something like a few 10 to the minus 18 meters that you have to measure. So we've made instruments that are capable of that. I won't go through them in detail, but I will show you at least one piece of it. We have two, one in Hanford, Washington, that's in the state of Washington, uh, not near uh, Washington, not near the capital, Seattle, but on the other side of the state, which is high desert. And one in Livingston, Louisiana, which is in a very unpopulated pine forest area. They're 3,000 kilometers apart, so that's the first thing to notice. And that means that if I had a gravitational wave and it came down from the top through Hanford and then went to Livingston, it would take 10 milliseconds to get to Livingston, so the signal would happen 10 milliseconds later in Livingston, or the opposite. If something comes up through Livingston first and then goes to Hanford, it'll be 10 milliseconds the other direction. So basically, and if something came down and bisected the two, they'll go off at the same time. The collaboration that built this is Caltech and MIT, and that's why I show them on the slide. These are the two detectors. They're identical in performance, identical technically, and in very different environments. The environment in the state of Washington is high desert, as you can see on the left, and the environment in Louisiana is swampy forests, very wet, very swampy. But the instruments actually are identical. We keep them identical. If we make an improvement in one, we put it, make the same improvement in the other, and they perform identically most of the time if we've kept the improvements in phase. So this is what we have to do. A gravitational wave comes through, and you can see the picture on the left, that the circle becomes squashed one direction and the other direction. And we have to measure that. It's measuring something that's a few parts in 10 to the minus 18. In order to accomplish that, there's two key challenges. One is that we have to basically measure the difference in phase when we split the light in the two directions and bring it back to one part in 10 to the 12 of the wavelength of the light that we use in the laser beam. That requires many, many optical tricks that, uh, and a lot of light that I won't describe in any detail, but took us uh, two or three decades to develop all the optical techniques to do that. If you go and see an interferometer in the laboratory in a school or in an instrument, they're usually good to one part in 10 to the two or 10 to the three or 10 to the four, so that we're orders and orders of magnitude beyond any. Uh, interferometer ever built. The second is that we have this instrument, as I showed you, on the Earth's surface, but the Earth moves a lot. And so we have to also isolate the instrument, basically float it on the Earth so that we can eliminate the vibrations of the Earth. At low frequencies, that requires basically eliminating the vibrations again to an incredibly small number. 10 to the minus 12. So those in a simple way are the two challenges that took us two or two de more than two decades to develop the technology. Just to pick on one part of it, the, which was the most important in making the measurements, to isolate ourselves from the ground, we basically use a vertical pendulum. You know that if you have a pendulum and you move horizontally, the, the mass on the bottom doesn't move very much. So any shaking horizontally, isn't going to do anything. And vertically, we use a very fancy array of shock absorbers, but we also put into that uh, seismometers that measure the residual motion, and we actively correct for any motion that, that beats the uh, shock absorbers. So this sophisticated system that took us years to develop was crucial in making the discovery of gravitational waves. This is the first detection of gravitational waves. What you're seeing is first on the left, you'll see that the scale is, if you can read it, is, is what's called the strain. That was that little h. And the units are 10 to the minus 21. So you see the wiggles go from something smaller 
but up to as big as one. That's one part in 10 to the 21. So we're able to see effects that are less than one part in 10 to the 21. The top and the signal going to the right is time, two tenths of a, se of a second. And it's just monitoring how much light gets through the interferometer at the end as a function of time. So what you see is some noise. That's how well we can measure. And then the uh, rising and falling of the signal getting narrower and larger, which is the so-called chirp signal. The Hanford detector shown in the upper left, the Livingston detector in the middle. And if you put one on top of the other, they essentially land on top of each other with a, a shift within the 10 milliseconds that I said of 6.7 milliseconds. If you look on the right, the top are the same two signals. One, the one on the left is Hanford, the one on the right is Livingston. And the second uh, uh, set that I'm showing now uh, are the calculations of Einstein's theory of general relativity for the parameters that I'll give you. If you, they look, it looks very similar, except obviously the wiggles from noise aren't there. And if you subtract one from the other, you just get the residual noise. So that's basically why we could, on the basis of one event, uh, know that we had seen gravitational waves. You can do a detailed fit to this uh, waveform. And if you do that, I just wrote down the formula here, you're able to tell uh, the masses of the two objects that came together, their spins, uh, the redshift. Uh, you can measure the amplitude is proportional to how far away it is. Uh, if you're even better, there's another term on this where you can measure the orbital precession, for example, on whether the spins are misaligned. And so far, we see no evidence of precession, but that's very hard to measure. We also measure in, on the same thing, the sky location by having more than one detector, the distance by the amplitude of the signal, and so forth and so on. So the amount of information, even though the number of events are small, is tremendous, and we're able to tell a lot. So that first event, was basically the merger of a 36 solar mass black hole with a 29 solar mass black hole to make a final event that was 62 solar masses. Notice 36 plus 29 is 65. So three solar masses, three times the mass of our sun within two tenths of a second <laughs> went away in the form of gravitational waves. So in terms of energy, it was the most energetic uh, event in the universe since during those two tenths of a second. It was 400 megaparsecs away, which we tell by the size of the signal. And unfortunately, like all of our events right now, it is at a low redshift. I'll come back to that. The second event we saw is shown here, and I just show this for illustration to say that it was somewhat lighter in terms of the two masses. So there's many, many wiggles. And if there's many wiggles, we then can look in detail at the data for these different wiggles and compare it with general relativity. So we're able to make precise tests of general relativity by comparing those. And in fact, in doing that, which we've done here, uh, we're able to show that there's no evidence for having a carrier of the force, what would be called a graviton, which doesn't exist in Einstein's theory, but does in quantum mechanics, maybe, is lighter than 7.7, .7, 10 to the minus 23 EV over C squared. So that's a limit. We now have collected quite a few events. We have uh, almost 100. I show here that as, we, as we've collected more events, we go further out into the universe. They basically follow a straight line where, where I took the volume seen integrated versus the cumulative distance. And so uh, there's no sign yet that there are any, they're preferentially located anywhere in the universe. On the right, we show the distributions of masses and spins. And uh, we're using those to try to understand where these black holes came from. 
So these are black holes that were heavy, not expected by electromagnetic uh, theories. In fact, believed to be difficult to be there because the general assumption has been that the black holes are made by the collapse of a star, but it's hard to have stars that are heavy enough to make these heavy black holes because stars are unstable when they get very heavy against radiation from the outside. They also have been uh, uh, proposed to be to come from dynamical effects where there's regions of the universe or there's many black holes, they eat each other up and slowly grow into these big ones. And a third possibility is that they're primordial. So they came in the early universe, in which case they could have something to do with the dark matter that we have in the universe. We haven't resolved that yet, but it shows in the illustration I gave here, just an example of the kind of questions we're able to address as we get more uh, data on black holes, on more data on black hole mergers. We're also, as we've collected more data, we have about 100 events now, we have several examples of events that are not easy to explain. If you look at objects that we know about, we know what a neutron star mass is. It's shown here on the bottom and the left. If you had a merger of two neutron stars, the distribution centers around 2.75 uh, solar masses and has a certain width. And the <clears throat> ones that we have detected, we uh, uh, an event that we've detected is five sigma away from that. And it's too low to be due to a black hole. Black holes themselves, a single black hole, is thought to have to be more than three solar masses. So we have events in a region that's forbidden. We have, secondly, events that are heavier than they're supposed to be. This is an example of an event where one of the black holes is 85. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, 85 solar masses. Another one is 66. They come together to make a 142 solar mass black hole. This is believed by astronomers to be not a region that is going to have black holes because of dynamics that happen in helium cores in that mass region. So somehow that hypothesis is apparently wrong, but we don't have very much data yet, but we have these kind of events. Now I want to finish the talk by talking about where I started, and that is how to use gravitational waves along with electromagnetic waves to understand the universe. And we're starting, we're starting to be able to do that. But to do that, we have to not spend a long time analyzing data, and then it's too late. We can't tell the ast astronomers what to look for. So we have to be able to make a quick analysis to know that we've seen some object in space that astronomers should look for. So in the upper uh, trace here, we basically take data from the interferometers, put them in our computers, try to figure out where the event came from quickly, and do that within a few minutes, and then send us uh, an announcement to astronomers where it is in the sky, and what it is, and what its parameters are, and uh, determine then within maybe 30 minutes if we were wrong uh, so that we can tell them, forget it, don't do it, uh, don't look for it. And this is a very challenging um, process to do in the events that I showed you where there's roughly 100 now, 80 or 100. The number of mistakes that we make is maybe 15% where we have to say we didn't see something. And the number of events that we miss in a very short time is also about 15 or 20%. So that's what we do. This is an example then, of a true observation using three different instruments. The Virgo interferometer, which is now operational, came on a couple of years after LIGO detected gravitational waves. And using three of them, we can triangulate. So the idea is shown here. We triangulate to where some event happened, we basically then determine where it happened and what it was. And that's shown here for the real event that we're seeing. So we saw on the lower left-hand side, a merger of 
what turns out to be two neutron stars, which we can determine the masses and so forth, that happen at the time shown here. This is a time slice going to the right. It was observed then in the same place in the sky, uh, 1.7 seconds later in this thing that's labeled Fermi on the right. And where LIGO and Virgo are is an area in between, smaller than that. But they were both together. So we observed two neutron stars merging and at the same time gamma rays, high energy gamma rays coming out from the same side. That was then sent out to all astronomical instruments. And the biggest mobilization of astronomical instruments ever was done where something like 2000 different instruments turned and pointed themselves in this direction in all different wavelengths, gravitational waves, visible uh, radio waves, gamma rays, even neutrinos. And uh, signals were seen. And I point out here, just they come at different times. We see the merger shown at the left. Then the high energy gamma rays were seen 1.7 seconds later. By the way, the 1.7 seconds is 1.7 seconds out of 150 million light years, which is how far away this event happened, which means 150 million light years is, is 1.5, 10 to the 15 seconds. So we've proven just by this observation that gravitational waves and light travel at the same speed to one part in 10 to the 15. Five hours later, we see the, uh, uh, we're able to get the accurate localization and see the uh, UV signals, the optical signals, and so forth, and eventually the x-rays and radio as well. So all of this was done. It then fits this uh, model of what happens when two neutron stars come together called the uh, kilonova model. And this just shows the details of the color changing with time as predicted in the model and seen in the data. An interesting result from this is that uh, one problem that we've had as physicists forever uh, in, in my lifetime as a physicist is explaining how the heavy elements got into the Earth when the Earth was formed. Uh, we know that most of the universe is made out of hydrogen and helium. Uh, we know that we can make heavy elements in the burning of stars because they happen by the fusion process. But the uh, burning of stars only burns by the fusion process up to iron. So how did, how did uh, objects heavier than iron get into the earth? Especially say ones we love like gold and platinum which are used in jewelry. Uh, for years, we've explained that as some enhancement of the nuclear physics in stellar collapse. But now I think the leading candidate is instead the kind of neutron star merger that we just saw. And if you just take the merger that we saw, it is, was an incredible factory to make gold. In fact, that merger by our calculations made a hundred earth masses of gold. Of course, it didn't contribute to the gold in the earth, but similar events that happened back at the time the earth was formed, uh, made it. So the leading candidate now for how you made that, make the heavy elements is the collision of two neutron stars. Let me just end by talking a little bit about the future. Uh, first, we, uh, we listened to Hitoshi Yamamoto talk about particle physics and know this spectacular and crucially important discovery of the Higgs was made in 2011. But the amount of progress since then has been slow. And the reason, which isn't quite this way that Hitoshi presented it, but I would present it now, is that the signal is a couple percent effect on top of a big background that's due to physics. In order to study the event better, of, to have uh, uh, Higgs better, you need a cleaner environment. And that's what an E plus E minus machine does for you, if you could have it. In our case, we have a clean environment. 
we don't have any physics background under the events that we've seen that's anywhere near detectable. Instead, what we have is noise that's technical, noise that comes from the shaking of the earth, noise that comes from RF pickup in our electronics, noise that comes from uh, not perfect uh, stability in our lasers noise that uh, uh, comes from nonlinearities in the optics itself, themselves. Those are all technical problems and can be improved. And we've been doing that. So that's why since the discovery of gravitational waves, we've been able to continue to improve the detector and improve our ability to do astronomy and physics with the detector. You can see the slope of the events that we get versus time are changing in the different runs. We run the data, take data for a year, do some improvements. The slope gets steeper, make some improvements again, run again, it, it gets steeper. So, and that process will continue because we know what technical improvements we can make. They're just technical. Uh, they take hard work and they take imagination, but they're not physics background. Uh, we also know that uh, we can foresee how you can make a much better detector for a second next generation detector. Uh, in the US, we've been looking at making a detector that instead of is four kilometers, is 40 kilometers on the side. Uh, it's uh, cryogenic, meaning we cool the detector that makes it quieter. Uh, and uh, it uh, has other uh, innovations that are better than the present detector. So if we look then at what we're able to do, almost everything that I saw we see so far is that almost no redshift. But as we increase the sensitivity, we start to move to higher uh, redshifts or back further in time. And we can foresee how to get back to early times or start to do cosmology with uh, gravitational waves. So the future in the long run, not the next few years, but the next decades, is to make gravitational waves detect detectors good enough to be able to see events at Z of 100 or Z of 1,000 and go back to early times. Also, we'll be going into space. So LIGO works on the Earth's surface. There's an approved experiment to go into space, and that technology has been demonstrated in a space mission called LISA. The experiment's called LISA, and it goes, LIGO goes from 10 hertz to 10,000 hertz, basically, to study uh, gravitational waves. LISA will go from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 4 or 5 hertz, and then you can go to even lower frequency by doing timing on pulsars, which are accurate clocks. And that's uh, also being done. So just like we've done multi-wave astronomy, we can look forward to doing multi-wave uh, gravitational wave. And uh, in space, this is just a picture of what it'll look like. It's a triangle. The arms are 2.5, 10, 10 to the six kilometers apart, and light beams are, are go around the triangular shape of this uh, interferometer. We're also considering whether a triangular shape for a future interferometer on the Earth is a better way to do it than the L shape that we've used so far. Lastly, the pulsar timing arrays uh, basically use the fact that we have these very accurate clocks, and if space and time gets distorted at low frequencies, it'll change the relative timing or accuracy of these different clocks. And that there's a, a worldwide collaboration using a radio, tele, radio signals that is trying to uh, see signals for gravitational waves. They haven't yet, uh, but they, I think, are quite likely to within the next few years. So with that, I'll say that uh, this is where we are in the gravitational wave it's a new frontier for astronomy and cosmology and astrophysics. And uh, it's taken 400 years to get to where we are 
in electromagnetic astronomy. And if we wait 400 more years, I'm sure we'll know a lot more about the universe through gravitational waves and probably neutrinos. Thank you. <laughs>